Just so just for demonstration, Dr. Dr. Preetish mentioned you are still using the baby so log that, uh, eight thousand. So that was a ventilator we tried with when we were training. And uh, the SLE, this is an older okay. version of the SLE. Right and, uh, my Acutronic. They are all similar screens, Stephanie. So most of the ventilators are sophisticated. They have the interface, which is on the screen, uh, touch screen uh, option. And the graphics we will discuss tomorrow makes it much easier for you. So we will hopefully at the end of the ventilation course, you will be comfortable using the graphics for your day to day and also train your team to look at it and make the uh, appropriate changes. So all of you are familiar with this, but we'll just quickly discuss uh, each one. So the peak inspiratory pressure or PIP, the positive end expiratory pressure, I time respiratory rate or IE ratio, flow rate and FAO2. So the flow rate, most of the time it's preset by the ventilator and you can adjust the slope as we will discuss. So most of the time you uh, adjust it only if you have want to adjust the rate of rise. Uh, and in the PSB also you have the rate of rise you can set. The FAO2, you don't really consider it as a ventilator setting. I mean, you have to be proportionate, but apart from that, you don't uh, restrict the nurses. You allow the nurses to control the FAO2 provided you have set, you need to keep checking whether the pressure you are keeping is proportionate to the requirement of the baby. And if your FAO2 is in the reasonable target range, then the titration is done by the nurses. So if, uh, if it exceeds a certain number, you may tell them to inform you so that you don't delay. The same happens with the closed loop uh, oxygen regulation. So nowadays the ventilators can feed back, but even there, if it's crossing a certain number of uh, FAO2, you need to be informed. So you look at whether you need more pressure or if there is anything else happening, which would make you adjust. So the positive pressure ventilation, we have some characteristics. And uh, so we have the beginning of the inspiration. The PEEP is the baseline. You don't start with zero. So always we use PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, because without PEEP, the lung is going to go below the closing volume and you're going to increase atelectrotrauma. So the damage to the lung is much higher. Then with the onset of uh, inspiration, the pressure rises. The flow will determine the rate of rise. Uh, so if the flow is very fast, uh, the high flow like 10 liters, you may get a square waveform. It goes up like this. We'll come to the next slide as well to show that. And uh, in pressure limited ventilation, you have the pressure cutting off as a plateau through the inspiratory time. And then at the end of inspiration, it drops. The modern modes like pressure support ventilation, when the patient's flow is uh, triggered to a certain level, like 15% drop, you uh, start getting the end of inspiration. So it's also very important to know the, uh, we will be discussing this in detail when you uh, discuss the pressure volume loop. So obviously you have the pressure and you have the volume and uh, in a very stiff lung like RDS, you need a higher pressure to open the lungs. So it's a very flat curve. And uh, as the lung complaints improves, maybe after surfactant or in a normal lung, it goes more vertical. <laughs> And the last part of it, the C20 by C, the ratio, if it is less than one, it indicates that the compliance is low in that part, the lung is starting to get over distended. So you should avoid that. So the beaking is one thing you would see. Uh, we will be looking at uh, the other aspects of this pressure volume loop tomorrow, but the aim is for you to be in the normal range and the PEEP setting should be proportionate to the stiffness of the lung. Don't delay surfactant if it is a RDS or a secondary surfactant deficiency. If the lung is struggling, support it early so that you come into the normal range quickly. So gas exchange, I mean, any parameter that improves the MAP increases the oxygenation. In addition to the FAO2, I already explained that oxygen is toxic. So use the FAO2 carefully and make sure the other settings are proportionate. And carbon dioxide removal, anything that deals with the minute ventilation, like tidal volume times respiratory rate, increases the carbon dioxide washout. So this is to illustrate again, uh, oxygenation is affected by the FAO2 on one side and the mean airway pressure. And any of these will affect the mean airway pressure. So this will show you how the area under the curve is affected. So the parameters we showed in the last slide, I mean, uh, each one will affect by affecting the area under the curve. So by increasing the PEEP, you are going to increase this area. By increasing the flow, you make it a square wave, and this is the area that's increased. By increasing the PIP, you increase this. 
and uh, by increasing the PEEP, actually you may drop the delta P if your PEEP doesn't increase, but in situations, so, so previously we used to say increasing the PEEP may drop, uh, may make your CO2 to rise. But if the lung is open, that will apply. If the lung is not open adequately, the increasing PEEP will help to keep the lung open better. So in a closed lung situation, increasing the PEEP alone may also improve your CO2 washout as well in addition to improving the oxygenation. And by increasing the number of breaths, the respiratory rate may also change this. So the PIP may affect both the PAO2 by altering the map and the PACO2 by affecting the tidal volume because uh, delta P will affect the tidal volume. A yeah, high PIP may increase the risk of volume trauma. As I said, even though the pressure we regulate with barotrauma, it's not the pressure itself, but the associated volume increase and beyond a certain level. Remember that the lung is not always homogeneous. There are different portions of the lung which are affected differently. So when you increase the PIP, one portion of the lung may get over distended and that distended part is going to have volume trauma and the other part which is closed down. So you need to do measures which can like positioning the baby, regular suction, chest physiotherapy if needed to help uh, improve it in certain situations. And of course, the adequacy of the PIP is checked by inflation and monitoring the blood gas. Now we have volume guarantee where the volume delivered is measured and the PIP is regulated according to that. So you are setting the maximum PIP. Dr. Dharani will be discussing that in the afternoon. So the PIP uh, prevents the alveolar collapse and it maintains the lung volume at the end expiration. There are the newer ventilators, especially in the PICU setting, they calculate the required PIP. They can uh, use the lung elasticity and other parameters to tell you this is the optimal PEEP for that baby. But in newborns, we are not using that routinely. But we can usually start with the PEEP of 5 to 6. Uh, PEEP below 5, as Dr. Karthik said earlier, is not ideal. And uh, you may use that in some situations. And in conditions like pulmonary hemorrhage or PDA with pulmonary edema, you may go for a PEEP which is slightly higher at 7. But you need to monitor for over distension. So the PEEP should match the lung compliance. And in low compliance states, a high PEEP is used. And in high complaint state, you don't want to over distance, so you use a lower PEEP. And uh, if there is a disproportionately high PEEP, the CO2 removal may be affected because the delta P, which is the gap between the PIP and the PEEP, is going to be reduced. So delta P is a pressure difference, basically. Delta is the pressure difference at a triangle sign. And uh, if there is over distension, it affects venous return the cardiac output may be affected. You may also cause what is called hydrogenic PPHN. So an inadvertent uh, PEEP uh, over generation, over distension will affect uh, pulmonary pressures because the venous uh, pressures will be affected. The increasing venous pressure, pulmonary hypertension. So we may end up thinking the baby is performing badly because oxygenation is worsening, but you are causing the problem by causing hydrogenic PPHN. So be aware of this. And if you see over distension, with the oxygenation difficulty, don't increase the pressure. Your idea should be to reduce and optimize the pressure till that time you may adjust a slightly lower oxygen targets. In terms of ventilatory rate, I mean, uh, for the past 25, 30 years, most of us are using high rate ventilation on conventional ventilation. So rate of 60 breaths per minute resulted in a reduced incidence of pneumothorax in preterm babies with RDS. So we know that RDS is a condition with uh, low compliance, so the time constant is short. So you manage with lower inflation times. As a baby gets older or you manage meconium aspiration or other problems, your time constant is more. So we have the initial videos which we shared, which cover all these topics. So the basics of what is the time constant, why uh, proper eye time is important as well. And tomorrow during the graphics discussion, we'll also see how we can pick up if the eye time is adequate. So the higher rate improves synchrony and uh, most of the studies that I mentioned about the improved benefit was before synchronization was routinely available. So you may get away with the lower rate SAMV, for example, now, because we also have the option of pressure support. So you're trying to optimize the lung injury. I'll come to the SAMV with pressure support later as well. And there should be an adequate expiratory time, which should avoid air dropping. So if you have a short eye time, time, uh, and a short expiratory time, the rate is very fast. But if you don't have adequate expiratory time, you will get air trapping. And generally, a high rate and low tidal volume strategy is preferred. High frequency is an example where the tidal volume is uh, subphysiologic and the rate is very high. That is lung protective. 
So the disease on time constant, I mean, we discussed this already that in HMD, which is a low compliant state, the resistance is normal and the time constant is low. In a normal lung, you have normal resistance, normal to high compliance and high time constant. So the inspirated time for a normal lung will be 0 0.4, 0 0.5 in that range. And meconium aspiration, you need adequate expiratory time. So usually we prefer a lower rate ventilation, 30 to 40 breaths is adequate in these babies. But remember that in meconium aspiration, you may have a low complaint situation if the lung has collapsed. So you go by the overall picture, the X-ray picture will guide you as well as to how you approach the strategy. And here the time constant is high because you need the high time to be slightly higher, but at the same time, the rate lower so that you have enough expiratory time. The changes in flow has not been well studied, um, but they affect the gases uh, minimally as long as sufficient flow is used. So the ventilator usually decides, of course, we have the option to adjust the flow, but we don't routinely use it. It takes as much flow as needed. If you are going on a transport, you should be aware of how much flow you are using because your cylinder will finish faster if you use a higher flow than you need. So if you are frequently transferring babies, you make sure you understand how much gas is there in your cylinder both in the incubator and in the ambulance and make sure if you are using high frequency, for example, the flow is very high. So again, high frequency in transfer is not routinely available. So we may need to switch to conventional, but if you do have high frequency with transfer, be aware of the flow that you use and the time it will last. You have calculations for that.